at, uh, 11 minutes past, so uh, no one has any excuses. Uh, so All let's right. welcome Adam, Adam Topaz from the University of Alberta for uh, the first of the two talks in this last session. And uh, the talk will be on formalizing results in anabelian geometry. All right. Um, yeah, so can everyone hear me okay? All right. Sounds, um, sounds good, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about um, some work that I did over the summer and then um, took a bit of a hiatus and uh, did a little bit more in the last couple of weeks just to make something presentable for this talk. Um, and the stuff, uh, the formalization stuff that I did over the summer, this was joint with uh, a, an undergrad who was, he was an undergrad at University of Alberta. His name is Coulter McDonald. Oh, sorry. And he's now a master's student at uh, Waterloo. Okay. Hello. Oh, I, I guess he's here. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. All right. So this is going to be a little bit different than some of the other talks in this workshop. Um, and my goal is to actually uh, stop using the slides later on in the talk and show you some code. Uh, some lean code, obviously, um, which is a formalization of an actual theorem, which is uh, one of the uh, somehow technical and elementary theorems that are used now in anabelian geometry. Um, and I hope it'll also be surprising and a new theorem for the number theorists in the audience. So um, I hope. Okay, so feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions as I go on. Uh, so very first thing I should do is describe what this word even means. Um, uh, I tried to come up with a little bit of a cartoon to illustrate what this is. And the idea of anabelian geometry in some sense is that you start with some um, object you're interested in. So object you're interested in. Um, for us arithmetic geometers, we're usually interested in fields, which are of interest, things like number fields or function fields of algebraic varieties over number fields, things like this, uh, or maybe a variety or a scheme. Um, those kinds of um, arithmetic geometric objects are the objects that I'm usually interested in. And then you consider one of the um, topologically flavored invariants of such an object. So for instance, you might take uh, the absolute Galois group of K. You can consider this as a topological object in the sense that it's determined by the tall topology of K. Uh, it, the, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna introduce some notation and terminology that's not gonna really matter for the formalization part of this talk. So. If um, you want to just kind of ignore the details and get a high level overview of what's going on, that's perfectly fine. Um, and of course, the analog of the Galois group of K for a scheme, a normal scheme, let's say, is the Atal fundamental group of X. So these are the kinds of objects and, and maybe even say the elatic cohomology of X. These are the kinds of objects that are going to be passed into this machine. Okay. And then there's some magic that happens. Okay. It transforms this topological information. And the goal, in some sense, it's to spit out K or X, or at least some information about K or X. Okay. So the general idea is you start with this um, topologically flavored invariant of the object you're interested in, one of these kinds of objects. You do some uh, constructions, algorithms, you prove some theorems, and eventually the goal is to try to recover some information about the arithmetic or geometry of the original object. Okay. I'll give some examples, of course. Okay, so how is this done? or maybe first why, why should this be done? Um, <clears throat> uh, 
So this uh, Annabelian program really originated with Grothendieck's um, Esquisse d'un Um And the goal in some sense was to study arithmetic or geometric objects using uh, Galois theory. Um, and maybe I should mention one of the original, uh, at least if I, if I remember correctly, one of the original motivations for uh, this sort of philosophy was as an approach towards the Mordell conjecture, which is a question about solutions to polynomial equations. It's a question about finiteness of solutions to polynomial equations. Um, so the precise statement, of course, is that what did any you say? genus you said Mordell? Mordell, the, yeah. A Mordell, yeah. So the Mordell conjecture says that if you have a curve of genus at least two over a number field, then it has only finitely many rational points. And of course, this is a statement that uh, whatever system of polynomials defining, defines that uh, genus G curve, that, that system of polynomials has only finitely many solutions over the base field. Okay. Um, so in some sense, uh, this was one of the motivating ideas um, was in some sense to view rational points or solutions to polynomial equations via what they induce on the level of a tall fundamental groups. Okay. I'm not going to really say any details about this, but maybe I should just highlight that in some sense, the main goal, at least the main reason I'm interested in it is because it can lead to new insights about the relationship between arithmetic and geometry um, by studying the structure of objects like the tall fundamental group. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, these are kind of the serious reasons why one should be interested in an abelian geometry, but of course, the, the real reason is that it's fun um, and interesting. Um, which is really the main reason why us mathematicians study the things that we study anyway. Um, but this begs the question, why would I be interested in formalizing these things? So I've listed a few reasons here. Uh, let me just explain what I mean. Um, so uh, number one here says that um, some of the more recent work in our dealing geometry depends on somewhat elementary, I mean, relatively elementary, I'll show you an example of such a result later today, um, but a fairly technical result. And in some sense, you take this as a black box and you sweep it under the rug when you prove more high level theorems in Abelian geometry. Uh, so of course, it's very good to know that the theorems that you're sweeping under the rug are actually correct. Okay. Um, that's uh, one reason. Another reason I'm interested in this is uh, because there's really no low hanging fruit in the subject. Um, progress is really just incremental. So I can give you an example. Um, there are several results along the lines of saying that if you start with say uh, um, a function field of uh, algebraic variety over an algebraically close field of dimension of these two, and you endow the Galois cohomology of this function field with some additional data coming from the arithmetic, then you can recover the field from that data. Okay, so that's kind of one black box. And then the question is, okay, can you recover that additional data just from the cohomology? That's another black box that you might wanna to patch together with the first black box and get a full Annabelian result, okay? And I think um, formalization could be useful in that regard. Um, I did want to mention number three here because um, there's some recent work on this. There are really two kinds of uh, results that people usually prove in this subject. One result says something along the lines of, uh, so let me say this here. If the Galois group of K is isomorphic to the Galois group of L, then K is isomorphic to L. So, so these sort of um, existence of isomorphism type theorems. Or even better, you can say that the isomorphisms between K and L are in bijection in a, some canonical functorial bijection with isomorphisms between the Galois group. 
<clears throat> so this is what I mean by the functorial version. Um, and on the other hand, there's the question of if you start with say some profinite group GK, can you actually just using the language of groups, maybe in higher order logic, can you actually interpret some object which is isomorphic to the original field? So is there an interpretation, some higher order interpretation um, of the field, let's say, uh, given the structure of the Galois group? So this is what I mean by construction. Well, this is vague, I understand. And I wanted to mention this because there's some interesting work. I'll mention uh, the Nogekhu Chida theorem later on today, which says that um, essentially there is a bijection of this form in the case where both K and L are number fields. And uh, just in the last couple of years, uh, so, so this Nogekhu Chida theorem, I think is from the eighties. And just in the last couple of years, a constructive version, not constructive in the sense of, uh, you know, formalization, but constructive in this interpretability sense uh, was proved by Hoshi. Uh, so, so this is, maybe I should use a different color. So these sort of results, uh, for example, the famous Dohyakushida theorem, which I'll mention later today, is a theorem of this sort. And recently uh, it was uh, refined by Hoshi. Okay. And I think formalization can really help us understand um, to what extent uh, results of this form can be made results of this form. Okay, so that's another reason I think it's interesting. And from a formalization perspective, I think formalizing results in an abelian geometry is very interesting because as hopefully I'll demonstrate later today, um, usually these results involve input from a lot of different subjects in pure mathematics. And just from a formalization perspective, it's, it's very interesting to kind of combine group theory, field theory, ring theory, all these different things and get some actually non-trivial results. Okay. But of course we all know the real reason is that it's fun. Okay. I think Kevin mentioned this a, a few days ago. Okay, and how we do this is usually via evaluation theory. Okay. So I said this very kind of buzzword uh, filled sentence here. Uh, valuations are the bridge that allow us to move between the topological side of the world and the arithmetic side of, or the geometric side of the world. Okay. And the main reason is that they usually have a very distinct and recognizable impression on um, the group theoretic objects that pass into this anabelian machine, okay? So, okay. Um, all right, so let's get away from this kind of high level stuff and go down to business. Um, the main focus of the rest of my talk is really gonna be about the valuation theoretic side of a lot of these results, because that's really the main thing that's uh, been formalized so far. Okay, so let me start by recalling what, what the definition is. So if you have a field K, all right, a valuation ring is a subring O. So well, let's see. So if I have a field K, evaluation is a valuation ring, excuse me, is a subring of O, a subring O of K, such that for every element of the field K, either X is in the subring or its inverse is in the subring. And of course here I'm using uh, as in lean or as in mathlib, let's say. So uh, in the sense that zero inverse is zero, okay. Yeah, so so um, in particular, you, you don't really mean either or, right? I mean, they can also be both in there. Yeah, I, I didn't put X or. <laughs> uh, you said either or, which I interpret as X or. Oh, okay. But anyway, yeah. uh, just to clarify for yeah, yeah, yeah. people who haven't seen this. Both can be true. Certainly both can be true. Okay. And in fact, as, as you see right here, in a lot of situations, both can be true. Okay. Um, so 
I'll give some examples in a second, but before I do that, let me just mention that there are some standard objects that you associate with evaluation ring. Um, the first one is the units of the subring. Um, you can think of this as just the units of O as a ring. Except that here you don't want zero. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> You're such a computer scientist. <laughs> Of course, the inverse of zero is, you know, it yeah. doesn't even exist. Uh, actually, maybe I should, I, I could have added zero, but then I should have said unit group with. Oh, very zero. good. Uh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Okay. So the unit group is the set of non-zero elements of the field. Uh, where both X and its inverse are contained in the ring, okay? Uh, the maximal ideal, of course, is the, uh, the unique. So it turns out that valuation rings are local rings and the maximal ideal is the unique maximal ideal. Um, but explicitly you can describe it as the elements of the field which are contained in the ring but whose inverse is not contained in the field. So this is just saying that it's the complement of the units in the ring. And then of course the principal units is just the additive coset of this maximal ideal with respect to one. Uh, but of course, another way to describe it is as the set of elements in K such that X minus one is contained in the maximal ideal. Okay. And just a remark, um, both the units and principal units are multiplicative subgroups of the multiplicative group of the field. So, I didn't say this, I didn't write this down, but this is standard notation for uh, X and K where X is non-zero, okay? And this is again a, a multiplicative group. Okay. So maybe some examples are in order. Um, here are some uh, kind of arithmetic examples and geometric examples. Uh, so everyone, that's involved in MathLib on Anzulip has seen the recent work on the piatics. Um, so that's why I put number two here. Uh, the piatic integers are a valuation ring inside of the piatic numbers, QP. Um, there's a non-completed version of this, which is the localization of the integers at the prime ideal generated by P. Um, and in fact, uh, you can classify all valuation rings of Q all have this form where P is prime, okay? Um, and there's a geometric analog of, of these two examples. Um, the geometric analog of this uh, localization of Z is the localization of the polynomial ring by um, the multiplicative system of polynomials, which are which don't have zero as a root, um, and of course the geometric analog of ZP is the power series ring. Okay. Maybe I should mention there are many many other examples. Um, I tried to come up with some examples I, I, that Adam, are. What does it mean to have k two parentheses t? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, this is just power series. That's the square or the round? That's the, the square is the, that's the square. And the round? Um, so maybe, let me, yeah. yeah uh, the and the, the, ra the round is the fraction field. Um, or it's the Laurent series. So you can think of it as taking the power series ring and inverting T. So it's the same as the thing on the left-hand side in number three? Uh, no. Uh, so this is the completion of the one parentheses K of T at the T-adic valuation. Okay, um, it, we, we can discuss this later. Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I can I can discuss all the details later if, if you're interested. Uh, but but this is the uh, ring of um, what's it called uh, rational functions. 
the field of rational functions. And the left side um, of I is just the ideal generated by T in the ring K extended by T, right? The, this, uh, this notation here. That notation means the ideal. This is just K. Uh, oh, this is just the, the, the principal ideal generated by T. The, oh, okay. So the whole left side is the localization. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But so that's why I said it's analogous to this example right here. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so maybe I should mention some other examples. I, I, I tried to come up with some examples that might be interesting, interesting for analysts. Of course, I could have talked about germs of holomorphic functions on a Riemann surface at a point or something like this. Uh, but maybe a slightly less common example, you can think about uh, something like this. Uh, so for instance, if we take the hyperreals, I don't know the notation for the hyperreals. Okay. Uh, R star is the hyperreals and you can take the set of bounded hyperreals. So the set of all hyperreals such that uh, there exists a natural number, let's say, where uh, the, the absolute value of X is bounded by N. So this turns out to be a valuation ring inside of the hyperreals. And uh, the maximum ideal is the infinitesimal elements. Okay. Okay, so th there are many, many, many interesting examples of valuation rings. Um, these are just a few of them. Okay. Okay, so it's worth mentioning that there are valuations in MathLib. Um, and if I understand correctly, maybe Kevin or Patrick or Johan can correct me. Yeah. This was a byproduct of the perfectoid spaces project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the way they're defined in MathLib is using this definition, which works for a general commutative ring. Okay. And the statement is that, or the definition is that evaluation of a commutative ring is a morphism of monoids from A to gamma, where gamma is, a, uh, again, I should have said here, monoids with zero. Um, from A to gamma, where gamma is a totally ordered commutative group with zero, satisfying these two axioms. Okay. I think a morphism of monoids with zero automatically sends zero to zero. It's the, you get it yes. for free. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, okay. So by monoids with zero, you mean a monoid that has both a one and a zero? Yes. And that when you multiply yeah, anything by like zero, you get zero. Yeah. So the absorb so the zero is absorptive. Is that, that's that's right. Absorbed. That's exactly okay. right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and there, of course, there's a kind of standard notion of equivalence evaluations defined in this way. And mathematicians usually think of valuations only up to equivalence. Okay. I'm not going to define what it means to be equivalent. You, you can, in fact, look in the code in MathLib and, and see the definition of equivalence. In it means they're the same, right? It means they're the same. <laughs> they're the same to a mathematician. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what's the relationship between these two definitions? So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between valuation rings in a field and valuations of the field up to equivalence. So modular equivalence here. Um, let me describe this correspondence. So if I have a valuation ring O, or maybe first, let me start in the other direction. If I have a valuation V, uh, and by the way, I don't like this notation. I'm gonna use the absolute value notation because as someone who actually works with valuations, when you write V, that's really like the negative logarithm of the absolute value. Okay, so um, I'll write, uh, instead of V of X, I'll write absolute value of X sub V, okay? So if I have such a thing, I can construct a valuation ring 
by looking at the set of all x such that the absolute value is less than or equal to one. So that's the easy direction. And then the other direction, so this is usually denoted by O of B. In the other direction, if I have a valuation ring O, I get a valuation by, um, considering this quotient. So just sending X to its coset by O star. And the point is that uh, the axioms and the valuation ring lets you define a total order on this abelian group by saying that, um, uh, okay, oh. by saying that uh, X is less than or equal to Y if and only if what? Uh, y over X is an O, okay? And because for any element of the field, either x, for, so for every x and y, either x over y or y over x is an O, this is actually a total order. Okay. All right, so there's this one to one, one correspondence between valuation rings and valuations. Um, and maybe I should also mention that uh, the case of fields is in some sense the most important because valuations on an arbitrary ring A, you can think of as um, a valuation on a certain field related to the ring A. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but uh, for, for those in, in the know, I can just mention that valuations on a ring A are the same as a prime ideal of the ring together with a valuation on the residue field of uh, the prime, okay? Uh, maybe I can, uh, I can give you the correspondence in this direction. You take V to the map that sends A to A mod P to the fraction field of A mod P goes to uh, gamma where this is V. Okay, so the composition here is going to be a valuation of the ring A. Okay. Um, okay, so was there anything else I wanted to mention? No. Okay, so um, I want to illustrate roughly uh, what sort of arguments people in Anabelian geometry do. Uh, and then I'll get to some actual, the actual formalization part of this project. So I mentioned this example earlier, the example of number fields, and this is a theorem of Nakikuchida. Which says that if uh, K and L are number fields, so number fields showed up in Kenny's talk earlier today, a number field is a finite extension of the rational numbers. Um, then I'll state it uh, roughly, uh, then K is isomorphic to L if and only if uh, the Galois group of K is isomorphic to the Galois group of L. And by the Galois group here, I mean the absolute Galois group. So the Galois group of the algebraic closure over the base. Okay. There, again, there's a factorial statement that one can say here, but I'm not gonna mention that. And this is roughly the sketch of, of how the argument works. You start with an isomorphism of the profinite groups you prove that uh, the decomposition groups of the various valuations are, uh, you, you can give a characterization of the decomposition groups of the various valuations. Okay, so that's what step one does. And maybe I should mention that this characterization uses global class field theory. So what, what is the decomposition group here? Um, I'm not gonna define it. <laughs> Uh, but, um, well, okay, so, you, you, okay, I'll, I'll say it in words. You take a valuation of K, prolong it to a valuation of the algebraic closure, and then you look at the stabilizer of the valuation of the algebraic closure inside of the Galois group. That's the decomposition group. So the Galois group acts on prolongations of valuations to the algebraic closure, and the stabilizer of the, the set 
uh, defining the valuation ring is the decomposition group. There's also an inertia group, which uh, is a subgroup of the decomposition group. I'm not, I, I don't really uh, want to discuss it. It's not really that important for the sketch. Um, but okay, I, I, I did want to mention that this uses global class field theory, which um, as certainly the number theorists know uh, is, you know, very, very high level uh, result. Um, now, uh, by some very general valuation theoretic nonsense, valuations are parameterized by their decomposition groups. So this is just some valuation theory, uh, particularly um, approximation theorems, let's say, for independent valuations. Um, and now is where uh, some more yeah. abelian geometry comes into play. Out of the, the decomposition groups of these valuations, there are certain numerical invariants you can recover purely group theoretically. And I'll mention what these are here. So if I have, say, a piadic valuation, you can recover, and, and you have the decomposition group, say, dv is a decomposition group of, of this piadic valuation. There are certain numerical invariants you can recover. For example, you can recover the residue characteristic p. You can recover the size of the residue field q. You can recover the absolute ramification index E. You can recover the absolute inertia degree F. Um, you can characterize the inertia group inside of DV purely group theoretically um, and, and, and so on and so on. Okay, there, there are some other invariants you can recover. Um, and this reconstruction process uses local class field theory. Okay. And finally, once you have all this data set up for you, you complete the proof. You actually prove that the fields are isomorphic um, using uh, these three dots, which I'm not gonna go into, but I will mention that these three dots use the Chebator density theorem. Okay, so at least in the way I've described it, uh, it seems like most of the, uh, essentially all of these steps are pretty much completely out of reach for formalization at this point. Okay. Um, so let me describe a slightly more <laughs> elementary example. Uh, some of the techniques that are used in this example can actually be used in the number field case. By the way, um, when I started at 1210 and I think I have 45 minutes, right? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay, great. All right, um, so I'll describe roughly a sketch of how another anabelian result works. Uh, and I put idea here because this is only known in certain situations, uh, but this is kind of the general strategy, which was outlined by Bogomolov. Uh, uh, Chinkel and by Pup. And the context is, um, is as follows. You take a certain field coming from algebraic geometry. In this case, it's the function field of some algebraic variety of dimension at least two over an algebraically closed field. Uh, so <clears throat> for example, you could take a, a complex um, algebraic variety of dimension at least two and look at the field of meromorphic functions. Okay. And the input object that we're interested in, in this case, is something uh, cohomological. In this case, I'm taking uh, the cohomology ring with ZL coefficients. Okay. L here is a prime, which is different from the characteristic of the base field. Okay. Now, this the is first like step. Topological cohomology, is that right? The, uh, this is a tall cohomology or a Galois cohomology, but um, there's a way to formulate this using things like singular cohomology in the, in the characteristic zero case. Uh, but uh, to be precise, you need to take uh, Galois cohomology in this case. Okay. Um, again, if you're interested, I could say more in, in the singular cohomology case after the talk. Um, but somehow the first step is to translate from this cohomological object, which is defined in terms of the atal topology, 
to something a little bit more elementary, which is defined just in terms of the arithmetic of the field. Uh, and these three dots use, uh, this is the block Cato conjecture, or really the Mercury of Suslin theorem is enough. In this case, uh, this is a theorem now due to uh, Rost and Voyabotsky. I'll define what this K-theory object actually is on the next slide. And now we have the same sort of process. You, you want to determine information about the valuation theory of the field in question. And um, this is something that's partially formalized. As I'll describe in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Now, once you do this, um, you have all this additional data. You have your K theory object. You have information about valuations. Um, and then somehow the goal is to reduce to a combinatorial sort of object, which is some multiplicative group with some structure of what's called the combinatorial geometry. Uh, in this case, it's a projective geometry. And I think the next talk today, we'll talk about matroids. So maybe the next speaker will tell us a little bit more about how combinatorial geometries are. But I should just mention here that in the last step, one uses the what's called the fundamental theorem <coughs> of projective <laughs> geometry. So as I mentioned, the process of reconstructing information about valuation rings of F from the Milner K theory of F, the, uh, this K star here, I should have said was the Milner K theory. Um, this is something that's now been partially formalized. So let me just explain what object we have here before I move on to some lean code. So T star this is a quotient of the tensor algebra. So this is the tensor algebra of the abelian group F star, F being a field. So F star is the multiplicative group, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you think of this as an abelian group, okay? And you look at the tensor algebra over Z. So any abelian group is a Z module. You look at the tensor algebra, and then you mod out by the ideal generated by certain relations. Um, these are the relations of the form X tensor one minus X, where the, the minus here really comes from the negation in the field itself. These are the so-called Steinberg relations. Okay. So this is a very elementary object. It's deeply related to Galois cohomology. X um, ranges among what? Sorry? So X ranges among all elements of F star? Is that right? Uh, F that's not zero or one, yeah. Zero because one. I want both X and one minus X to be non-zero. But X is just one member of that. It's just it's just a single element of the field. Yeah, exactly. But you, you run over all of them, right? Yes, over all yeah. of them. So yeah, so okay. Okay, so um, let me see. The next slide is a demo. Uh, and let's see, I have about what five minutes left, which is perfect. Um, so let me stop sharing this and I'll share my laptop. Uh, where am I? Okay. Can everyone see my laptop screen? Yeah. All right. So this is a lean file in a very scary Emacs buffer. I'm again, one of those people that thinks that Emacs is the correct editor. Um, 
so let me explain what is going on in this file. And I'll post a link to this repository um, later on on Zulip. So I just have some imports. And I should mention that uh, what's contained in this repository so far is a formalization of what's called the theory of rigid elements based on these two references here, uh, particularly the second one by Arison, Elman, and Jacob, which appeared in the late 80s. Okay. So first, there's some objects that I need to introduce. Uh, the first one is log, which is just a homomorphism from the multiplicative group of a field K to the additive group of a field F. So it's a function from k to f, sending 1 to 0, it sends multiplication to addition. And 0 to 0, you should really think of 0 here as a junk value. OK. Um, we have valuation rings in this repository, which are defined, as I said earlier. They're subrings of a field k where either x or y minus x is contained in the carrier of the field k. Uh, this repository also has a basic API for multiplicative subgroups of the field. Um, so a multiplicative subgroup is just a set of elements of the field, which does not contain 0. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> uh, it does contain 1. It's closed under multiplication and closed under inverses. Nothing surprising there. Oops. It's a subgroup um, with zero, but without the zero. Yeah, but but okay. For for my purposes, it turns out I don't want zero in this. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through this definition of a join. This is just a way of adjoining an element to a multiplicative group and looking at the group, the multiplicative group generated by a given sub multiplicative subgroup with a non-zero element. Um, I do want to discuss this definition because in some sense, this is the main definition that's used in this paper on rigid elements. Um, it's a technical definition that you can define for any multiplicative subgroup of a field. Okay. Um, it's some uh, proposition which is determined by the addition in the field in some very rough sense and the multiplicative structure of the, the group with relationship to the multiplicative structure of the field. Uh, by rigidity is just defined as saying that both x and 1 minus x are rigid. OK. Um, a rigid pair is a pair of multiplicative subgroups which are nested. So I have uh, two multiplicative groups, t and h. t is included in h. And any element which is not a member of H, has to satisfy this bi-rigidity condition. Okay. Uh, a join is an analog of a joining from multiplicative groups for rigid pairs. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, the main definition is this OO, which is just an explicit definition of a certain set defined in terms of a rigid pair. So R here is a rigid pair. There's some definition. If you're interested, you could look at the source code later. I don't really want to go into this. Um, and then there are some other uh, definitions and theorems. But let me actually state the main theorem of this work. So I'm giving myself a field k, two logarithms from k to z mod 2. I need to assume the condition that the field k <coughs> has uh, that negative one is a square in my field K. So that's what I'm assuming here. In particular, if K is characteristic not two, then I should have that K contains the fourth root of unity. And then I have this condition, which I call Steinberg alternating. Okay. And I don't really want to discuss too much about this, but at least superficially, you should be able to see that this condition is related to the relations that I've defined in the definition of the Milner K-theory. So I'll just say related to definition of Milner K-theory. Okay. okay, so let me uh, state my main theorem here. Uh, why did I, 
I put a bunch of empty spaces just for dramatic effect. So here's the theorem. It says that under these assumptions, there's a valuation ring, two elements in Z mod two, one of which is non-zero, such that the principal units, that's the one plus M associated to the valuation ring, is contained in the uh, kernels of both of these logarithms, F and G, and such that the units are contained in the kernel of the linear combination associated to A and B with respect to F and G, okay? And maybe just a remark that if F and G are linearly independent over Z mod two, uh, because of this assumption on A and B, this linear combination will be non-trivial. So the units will be a proper subgroup of the multiplicative group of the field. And in particular, the valuation will be non-trivial. So this is really a non-vacuous result. And then just to prove to you that uh, it is indeed a theorem, okay, I've, I've uncommented the proof here, which I'm not gonna go through. You can look at the code yourself. No sorries in the imports and no sorries in the example. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. Um, so maybe this is a good place to stop. Uh, I wanted to mention something about uh, what the future might hold for formalizing an abelian geometry, but uh, for the sake of time, if, if you're interested, I'd be happy to discuss this on Zulip or uh, somewhere else. Okay. Thanks. Think, uh, thank you very much, Adam. Thanks. Behind, but are there any? Does anyone have a question that is on their mind? Don't you think it's about time that we just stated the main theorems of local and global class field theory and had done with it, and then just assumed them and kept going? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> and I, I had one question. Do you, uh, do you think it would be possible to state Lenstra's theorem that that the K two of a global field consists of symbols? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, doesn't that use, that uses global class field theory? Well. Oh, you, you, just the statement. The statement doesn't, but you're right. If you would, the statement is very, is somehow, yeah, the, the statement doesn't, but the, the proof is more interesting. Easy. Yeah, the statement is easy, but I was thinking of the proof, but you're right. You need global class field theory. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the proof uses global class field theory. Yeah. I mean, the only proof I know of, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Did you encounter anything unexpected, Adam, while formalizing this? Did you learn anything about this mathematics? By, while yeah, working? good question. Um, the proof of this, I can, I can, maybe I'll share my screen just for five more seconds here. Um, I want to show you some of the, proof that one actually does here. This is one of the longest proofs. This is an even longer proof. Um, I found it kind of surprising that this is an elementary result, but it was extremely, extremely tedious to prove. I don't know if I'm doing it in a ill-advised way or not, uh, but I think it's mainly tedious and horrible to prove because it involves a lot of case-by-case -case proofs. Um, I don't know how to avoid these uh, different case, you know, these proofs that go case-by-case -case in some sense. Um, I would be very happy to, to try to clean things up a little bit. Uh, I don't. Uh, how did it look like in the textbook? Uh, uh, do they do one case in the textbook and the, the rest are exercises for the reader? Or, uh, the, the, <laughs> also in, in the textbook. The, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of proofs in the, in the paper say, oh, we may as well assume that this is, you know, this element is non-zero because the case where it's zero is completely obvious because of corollary 5.3.2 you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, but then of course, that's a case that you have to check. Um, so why don't we uh, continue this later in the social time and uh,